My favorite thing about Quant is that we invent and push boundaries every day. We live in a hyper-connected world and society that's ever-growing and ever-increasing. Our purpose at Quant is to unleash the power of networks as connected as the world we live in. Blockchain and DLT, Distributed Ledger Technologies, are transformational and foundational to society. The biggest challenges enterprise face is the lack of interoperability and the ease of use. Quant is solving the problem of complexity in DLT in two ways. One, one is to make it much easier to use. Um, so we have an API that, that hides all of the complexity, makes it straightforward for developers to work with DLTs. The other thing is we're making it interoperable. So at the moment, there's lots of areas that are isolated where there's a lot of value and we, we connect those together and make them available through the same easy to use interface. We're split into two sections, R&D and engineering. So our R&D does the complex heavy lifting and understanding uh, how to solve the problem in a prototype and then we hand it over to engineering to make it enterprise level application. Our core technology Overledger delivers universal interoperability that is fit for future and enterprise oriented. We see numerous possibilities for enterprise and developer use cases for Overledger. The way I see the technology being applied in, in the mid-market is mainly around finance. So tokenization of assets, uh, new models for syndicated loans, new models for trade finance. There's a, a number of initiatives in that area and Overledger will accelerate those because at the moment they are traditional blockchain projects that are working in isolation. The way I see the technology being applied more at a macro scale uh, is systems that are linking countries and linking trade blocks, so EU region, Latin America region, um, and then specific corridors between countries where many flows are being digitalized on DLT, and those DLTs need linking together to make that work properly. Quant powers a hyper-connected world of interconnected networks. That's the future. future of money. Uh, what is this all about? Well, check out what's cited here, okay? So start off the outline for Q&T. The future of money is now visible. What does it mean for you, right? Well, talks about these events and so on. And you got to keep in mind, they talk about this specific event. And if anything, I think I will blow this up a little more. I apologize. It's kind of small on your screen. So you know, when it comes to quant, if somebody was to ask you, like, what stands out about quant, Max, other than just interoperability? Can you do another one-liner? Well, I'll steal this one from Tokenizer. It's, quant should be looked upon as being like the tokenization, because we were talking about tokenization last night, maybe to the point where you got tired of me talking about it. The tokenization of CBDCs, whether you're form or not, right? So it goes on to mention this whole idea of cryptocurrency stable coins and how they're basically going to one day replace fiat cash right um seems like less realistic today than any other time you know in the past but you gotta keep in mind you will start seeing more things and if anything who's coming together at the table to get these things really really going well, it's a lot more than just the bank of international settlements there's a lot more than just the bank of england and so on you're starting to see some of these big big players also here locally in the united states your jp morgans if you will i want to put some emphasis on this it says basically in fact the most plausible future of money is now uh one in which is an inverted excuse me inverted pyramid of tokenized deposits which sit on top of a fulcrum made of central bank digital currencies right cbc's it looks awfully like a past and present in which commercial bank money including e-money sits on a fulcrum of central bank money, which suggests the national and international monetary establishments have reasserted their control of money. Uh, if you missed last night's show, the guy that was a guest with Lewis Jackson went into detail, right? Really extensive detail about that control of money. And if, if you want to disturb or take away that control, then it's basically what we're invested into you know, your, your XRPs and so on. But for this outline, we're going to talk about quant, Q&T. So defeating the ambitions of the, like it says, um, 
libertarians, I'm actually a libertarian, anyway, and the innovators that spawn myriad cryptocurrencies, the truth is more complex, all right? The innovative ideas and technologies of the cryptocurrency pioneers are now being embedded in a monetary system that is evolving towards faster, cheaper, more transparent, and more open forms of money and payment. But at the end of the day, which design of like a CBDC will, I don't know, come out on top? So there's this meeting that's basically ha going to happen. And I wanted to basically get into why that's significant, especially for you. Um, who's going to attend this or who should attend this? Again, you're going to see this outline of how we tie it all in. So it says anybody working in securities, money, payment, foreign exchange, right? Any user, security, money market, payments, FX services. When is this going to happen, right? Well, for one, we talk about dates. I get criticized about talking about dates. Rombo, right? Shout out to Rombo. Always criticize, criticize me about dates. Hey, I can take it. But when is this specifically going to happen when these conglomerate uh, big wigs are going to come together? Well, it's going to be Thursday, November 30th. Now, I'm also paying attention to like what you guys have pointed out in regards to ISO 222 and the implementation. But here's some of your key takeaways about what is going to be discussed at this specific conference, if you will, or meeting. So we're going to talk about regulation, right? And how they need to talk about to restore public confidence in cryptocurrencies, like how it's going to create that confidence or it's going to destroy it. Our CBDCs in the you know major currencies ready to move beyond the experimental stage. Yeah, no kidding, right? Um, I think we're tired of the whole idea of you know us as investors being guinea pigs, but CBDCs in itself is a brand new concept. Uh, you know, in reality, it's it's still kind of a brand new concept, and it's not even been fully implemented. If anything, it has hardly been implemented or not at all, right? Are CBDCs relevant to making domestic payments faster? So all sorts of topics here, stable coins. We always talk about the pairings of all this. Some of the key areas I want you to pay attention to is this question. Are tokenized deposits a glimpse of future or, or the future of a commercial bank money? Remember we talked about that a little bit last night. Is atomic settlement a flawed concept? Why is netting making a comeback? But this part will be the highlight for tonight. Where do finality, and don't forget this part, especially if you've been paying attention to the daily show, Parsher and the ideas of a regulated liability network, RLN, and how they fit into the future of money, right? This last question, could all the forms of digital money and digital assets be issued, traded, and stored and serviced on a common programmable, excuse me, programmable platform? Who is on the panel? Well, boom, boil it, mash it, stick it in stew because Mr. Gilbert Verdian, CEO of Quant Network, is going to be there. Huh. I think I know where Max is going with this. Well, hopefully you do. How about this for size? Who's mentioned as number two on this particular list? Jack Fletcher, head of policy and government re uh, relations, digital currencies at R3. Did you see the deep dive we did about R3 recently? Have you seen other ones of the past? But R3 is a big, big deal. Always have been. How about, for instance, uh, some of these other guys, right? Yeah. Um, you have, for instance, this lady or this person, lady, Dominic Hobson, co-founder at Future of Finance. So a lot of big wigs, to say the least. I'm getting more into this and why I want to point it out to you. Is this right here. Not so much a Gilbert Verde be on the panel. But like it says on the very bottom, the future of finance, getting more into this, right? Well, I think we repoint that out, right? R3, my bad. Let's pull up the next page. Yeah, here we go. Where do finality, partial, and the ideas of regulated liability network fit into the future of money? Well, we already highlighted that, but just in case you missed it, a highlight again with a marker. Now, this is something that's cited from a site that we're going to get into here in a second. I'm going to even tie in some real deep dive stuff for you guys in regards to how the SEC feels about this. For real. For real. I hope that will create less doubt. But the bottom line is this. You have this thing about the, uh, the thing called OCC, non-objection <clears throat> letters. It says, when JP Morgan goes live on the partial network, let me still check my settings. Sorry about that. 
Yeah, when they go live on the Parser Network, it will confirm the existence of the OCC non-objective letter. And then basically speaking, this will be a breakthrough at a time when the United States regulators have been reticent of about the whole concept of both cryptocurrencies and even blockchain. After Michael, um, if I pronounce that right, Hugh or Sue took over as acting comptroller of the currency in November of 2021, he issued a letter requiring all banks, all of them, to apply for a written non-objection. This applies not only to cryptocurrency activities, but also to any distributed ledger. And listen to this part, just in case you're drifting off. Applications, including the ones like Parser, given um, Hughes or Sue's, I'm going to call them Sue because maybe that's silent. Prudent but tech-savvy approach, a non-objection letter carries significant weight. Now, we'll cite here in the moment the whole thing in regards to this non-objective letter. And I know what you're, some of you guys are going with this. It's like, well, what about the SEC? Do they go after this? Trust me, you're going to want to stay tuned to that. So does it carry any significant weight? Well, what about the Deutsche Bank and their DLT interest? Look at this. To, or turning to Deutsche Bank, the major German banking associations have been working on tokenized bank deposits co uh, called commercial bank money tokens. Think about this. Commercial bank money tokens? Huh. Four major German banks have started token trials, but Deutsche Bank was an obvious absentee. Deutsche Bank's uh, Sabi Bazad, who has digital assets and currency transformation commented at least then that a key interest of the bank is intraday liquidity i did the whole deep dive about intraday liquidity remember if you do remember i talked about institutional swaps does, does anybody remember me talking about that maybe you don't if you're new you don't but if you're old school and been uh, with this community for over a year you do remember me talking about intra, intraday swaps, talk about institutional swaps. I think I did that coverage maybe a month and a half ago. But it goes on to mention that um, without mentioning Parsher, this particular guy, right, uh, Sabir Bazad, he was talking at the FT Crypto Summit. Deutsche Bank has previously been involved with intraday FX swap trials. Remember the institutional swaps? We make it a bit deal about that and just mention it with london startup fintium when meanwhile on the other high profile interbank payment networks of course include finality we did a deep dive about that which is planning to launch in the uk this year and the regulated liability network hence why i'm putting so much focus on this rln which is conducting experience with the new york federal reserve <clears throat> not to mention remember when i did the coverage at late uh last year in regards to uh, the New York Fed, um, MIT, and Quant Network. You know how much criticism I got about that? Oh, this is a nothing burger, Max. This is all speculative. And then later on, we end up confirming that. So there was that. Now, getting more into this. Back to the whole thing about OCC. So here's the original uh, press release. It was November 23rd, 2021. You need to pay attention to this. I don't care if you hold Quant or not. Listen to this for a second. OCC clarifies bank authority to engage in certain cryptocurrency activities and authority of OCC to charter national trust banks. Now, this is uh, not too super deep to get into, but I'm going to give you some examples real quick. Why am I pointing this out to you? For one, that letter confirmed that national banks and federal savings associations must demonstrate that they have adequate controls in place before they can engage in what? certain cryptocurrency distributed ledger and stable coin activities yeah shortly after taking office acting comptroller michael j sue announced a review of occ interpretive letters which are 1170 1172 and 1174 they were issued in 2020 and even in 2021 those letters clarify that activities addressed in the previous inter oh, excuse me interpretive interpretive excuse me letters can be conducted after a bank notifies its supervisory office of its intent to engage in activities and after a bank receives written notification of the supervisory's official non-objection the bank should not engage in the activity until it receives a non-objection from a supervisory office now this quote i will read it and i'll kick it over to the sec part of things here in a bit 
Here's the quote. It states, today's letter, at least back then, reaffirms the primacy of safety and soundness. Providing this clarity will help ensure that these cryptos or distributed ledgers and stablecoin activities will be conducted by national banks and federal savings association in a safe and sound manner, according to Sue. Because, quote, many of these technologies and products present novel risks. Banks must be able to demonstrate that they have the appropriate risk management systems and controls in place to conduct them safely. This will provide assurance that crypto asset activities taking place inside the federal regulatory perimeter are being conducted responsibly. Now, in layman's terms, do you not follow what's going on? So for one, this big meeting is going to happen in November. Now we know that ISO 222 is going to have, I guess you could say, the beginning of the implementation where you know we see a little bit of that utility in motion but my thing is this we've been talking about for the longest time the whole concept of regulatory framework right so is this a nothing burger or is this a big deal well i think it is this particular uh part and we'll kick into the sec part the letter provides a roadmap listen to this part for banks to engage with their supervisory office to provide a written notification of their proposed activities and outlines the criteria that the OCC will follow to evaluate the proposed activity and provide supervisory non-objection. If the bank receives a supervisory non-objection, the OCC will review these activities as part of its ordinary supervisory processes. On top of that, this letter follows the release of an interagency statement on the Crypto Asset Policy Sprint Initiative. Both are part of the OCC's efforts to provide clarity about crypto assets and the federal banking system. Do you not understand how bullish this is? I honestly think this is why, you know, we put so much emphasis on towards the end of the year. And, and like, you know, even this headline that you see on, you know, um, the title of this show talks about like, is the bull market or, you know, yeah, is the bull market soon, right? I mean, think about it, right? Getting into this, let's share the part about the whole thing with the SEC. So basically speaking, I'm going to get into this, and it's right here straight from this particular SEC Gov Files litigation release back in 2022. It goes on to mention this at the very top, excuse me, about February 17, 2022, self-regulatory organizations, the Options Clearing Corporation, the notice of no objection to advance, excuse me, notice concerning the Options Clearing Corporation's cash and investment management. I'm going to take it to this part because I'm not going to read all of this, 14 pages. Here's the highlights. Discussion and notice of no objection because we're just talking about this. Although the Clearing Supervision Act does not specify a standard of review for advance notice, the stated purpose of the Clearing Supervision Act is instructive to mitigate systemic risk in the financial system and promote financial stability by, among other things, promoting uniform risk management standards for SIFMUs and strengthening the liquidity of just that, the SIFMUs. Getting to the next part of that about this. It is there for, in conclusion, right? It is there for notice pursuant to Section 806E11 of the Clearing Supervision Act and that the commission does not object to advance notice, what was referenced here, and that OCC is what is authorized to implement the proposed change as of this date back in February or where it was, 2022, nor uh, of the date uh, of an order by the commission approving proposed changes. Um, bottom line is they're not going to go after this, right? So that's cool. It's worth pointing out, right? Um, let me jump into this for a second. I'm not able to hit the button. There we go. So we're going to now talk about this, and it's basically back to the whole thing of Deutsche Bank. Remember, we just cited this. So again, if you're wondering, well, where do where does Deutsche Bank come into this? Yes. How soon was this? Well, let's give you an update. Right, because a lot of things, even though it happened a few months ago, it just doesn't make the mainstream news. Let's just be honest about that. So, uh, Deutsche Bank, SMBC, join Parshore, like how me and Quant Papa tied this in, DLT Payment Network for a co founded, you know, that's co founded by who? JP Morgan. Hopefully, I have grabbed your attention in regards to this. Now, getting more into it, let's pull this down for a second. Again, guys, even if you don't own Quant, this is a big, big deal because you know what? A lot of naysayers say there's no way in 
heck that we get crazy amounts of market cut, uh, cap coming into the overall crypto space. And you know what, if I was part of that, you know, argument, I guess, you know, without looking more into it, I, I would probably agree. But if anything, I'm not trying to convince you on anything. It's not financial advice, but I think some people are going to FOMO into crypto when this gets a little bit more further out, or maybe they don't, maybe they just FOMO in when everything is just sky high, right? Let's just be honest about that. So getting into this, Parsher, because we're talking about Parsher, we've been talking about it for probably a week now. The blockchain network for what multi-currency interbank payment has signed to Deutsche Bank and SMBC as members of its network, according to multiple ledger ins, uh, insight sources. Listen to this. They co, uh, excuse me, they join co-founders JP Morgan, Standard Chartered. You know how many times multiple content creators have referenced Standard Chartered? Yeah, maybe it's wearing your, your ears out. But also DBS Bank. Listen to this for a second. Additionally, they have also confirmed rumors that the office of the comptroller, again, back to the whole thing of OCC, um, the currency OCC, one of the primary U.S. banking regulators, regulators excuse me, has provided a non-objection letter to J.P. Morgan, allowing it to proceed to use the Parsher network. So again, that particular document we just showed you, February 2022, now May 10th of 2023, a few months ago. Allowing it to proceed to use the Parsher network. Ledger Insights has not seen the letter, or nor will they probably, right? Because of NDAs or whatever the case be. But the bottom line is <laughs> JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank, and Parsher declined, of course, to comment, but it says that they did not receive response from SMBC at the time. Um, of the publication, however, sources close to the German bank said the news is speculative and no decision has been made, right? But again, what's coming up here soon? While JP Morgan is known for its, of course, JPM coin, like you guys have pointed out, the solution is a blockchain-based bank account used for payments between JP Morgan, bank customers. In contrast, Parsher, because we're talking about Parsher a lot, is a blockchain network for interbank cross-border payments and is planning to support numerous currencies. Now, it gets more into this, and I'm going to jump down to some of these parts. And you got to keep in mind this, right? Um, let me see here. Yeah, this is this part's also good. I, I thought I was going to skip this part, but I don't want to. The Singapore firm was co-founded by JP Morgan, DBS Bank, Temasek in early 2021. Standard Chart, of course, joined with them back in November 2022. Um, and also, yes, followed from Project Ubin. Remember, we did that quant connection with uh, Project Ubin. You guys can look more into it. I did a whole outline about Project Uben and Quant. The bottom line is this a central bank digital currency experiment by the Monetary Authority of Singapore. However, now the solution, you know, is that um, they're basically going to use commercial bank money. Okay. Getting down to this part about OCC one more time uh, about the non objective letters that we just cited from the SEC. When JP Morgan goes live on the Parsher network, and again, this is a real key emphasis part. It will confirm the existence of the OCC non-objective letter. So for one, the SEC is not going after it, right? And then have this confirmation, it's a big deal. But why so much make a big deal about this in regards to quant? We're going to get into that. This will be a breakthrough. Listen to this. At a time when U.S. regulators have been uh, reticent about both crypto and, of course, blockchain. Um, goes on to mention some of the things we decided in regards to Mr. Sue. But turning to Deutsche Bank, the major German banking associations have been working on tokenized bank deposits called commercial bank money tokens. Four major German banks have started token trials, but Deutsche Bank was an obvious absentee. Now, I did cite the thing about intraday FX swaps, and I'm not going to get back into that. But what I do like here is this whole thing of London startup Fintium. We know that, you know, the UK is leading the charge when it comes to um, this whole thing in regards to, I guess you could say, the groundwork for going into this new monetary system. It says, meanwhile, other high profile interbank payment networks, including Finality, is planning to launch in the UK this year and also regulated liability network, hence we, why we've been talking about a lot lately, which is RLN which is conducting experiments with who? The New York Federal Reserve. Now, let's take you to this for a second. 
I did cite the whole thing about Project Yubin and how there's central bank digital currency experiment by the Monetary Authority of Singapore. But I want to share this with you in regards to Euro money because it talks about Parsher. Now, this time we gave you that citation from, was it May? Now let's jump now to August. I'm trying to tie all of it in together for you guys. It's, it's not. It's sometimes people are like, I just want it all in five minutes. And to be honest, I don't know how I can do it in five minutes. Parsher takes DLT payments live at pioneering banks. Again, report August 3rd, 2023. Let's catch you up on this. It says, while central banks announced the latest controlled test on blockchain based digital money in a handful of leading commercial banks they are already in full production all right full production back in july the federal reserve bank of new york had an innovative um, successful conclusion of an experiment for many banks to make a wholesale dollar payment in both central bank digital currency and in digital commercial bank money on a shared multi-entity distributed ledger this confirms all of the research that we did late December of last year going into the new year that people say what well, was speculative. Boom, there you go. On top of that, this is the regulated liability network, RLN, whose participants alongside the feds, New York, I'm uh, sorry, NYIC, and also BNY, or excuse me, yes, BNY Mellon, City. Remember we gave you guys the uh, example of City choosing quant network? HSBC, how about MasterCard? Are we not referencing Gilbert Verde once again? Um, how about a little bit more about this? Swift, is this, is this not catching your attention? Um, US Bank and even Wells Fargo. After years of theorizing about what interoperability across a network of innovative wholesale payment rails, banks are starting to see what a universal distributed ledger might look like. Who the heck do you think that universal distributed ledger is? Come on, guys. Are we not paying attention? From a central banking perspective, the proof of concept was conducive to exploring tokenized regulated deposits. Who's been talking a lot about that lately? Yes, Larry Fink. Who's also been in interviews talking about tokenized deposits? Yes, Gilbert Verdian. Hmm, interesting. Now look at this quote. And this comes from... Uh, what's his name? Per von Zel Zelowitz. He states, from a central banking perspective, and maybe even from your own perspective, if you're still following this, the proof of concept was conducive to exploring the tokenized regulated deposits and understanding the potential function benefits of central bank and commercial bank digital money operating together on a shared ledger. My goodness. Getting more into this. I want to highlight this. This is from ledgerinsights.com uh, par, uh, slash parser-jp Morgan. Talks about a clear strategy rem reminiscent of Swift. Now, this part, I want to pause for a second, and I want to put some emphasis, a lot of emphasis on this. So you know how many times people say, like, for instance, XRP is going to replace Swift, and I have stated, I don't think XRP replaced Swift. I think it upgrades Swift, all right? But what about the argument of some people are like, nah, Max, what about these other ones that are literally going to replace Swift? Could this very well be an answer for you and everybody else in which we have finally an example of something solid with proof of replacing Swift? Now, you may say this is still not proof, and that's okay. You know, there's some people who are just always going to say no way. But I want to present this to you. Make your own conclusion. I'm not trying to hype anything. I'm just trying to provide information. Look at this for yourself if you don't believe me. Here's an example in regards to this. A clear strategy reminiscent of SWIFT. Hmm. Many new infrastructures profess to be the next SWIFT, a digital assets or payments. Parsher makes no such claims. But if you observe a strategy, it looks like a nimbler, more open and interoperable SWIFT. Oh my goodness. Now we reestablished the whole thing of Parsher with Quant. And we also established the whole thing of Parsher with JP Morgan. But look at this for a second. It's COO Stella Lim hails a course from Swift. Parsher positions itself as a network rather than a payment or settlement system. It aims to make digital clearing and settlement more efficient, reliable, and secure for financial institutions. My God. If you've been paying attention to quant for the longest time, you already know where you're at. Be it banks or non-bank financial institutions, while Parsher is a wholesale network, it also supports others 
that add retail payment applications on top of its network. Oh my goodness. So yes, it is universal, right? Seems like it. There's more. Quote, Parser is not a payment system, said Thompson. We cannot instigate a transaction, move, store money, or create finality, and we do not acquire any data. However, that means that like Swift, it neither needs a central bank account nor direct central bank approval, although commercial banks may need to get to a green light from their regulator to use this network. This point is critical because it enables Parser to move at speed. Now listen to this part about banks. Banks have nodes on the network to make payments, and banks are in control. They own the smart contracts. They have control over their deployment, initiate payments, and determine finality. Payments are in commercial bank money. The fact that Parser grew out of a central bank digital currency, CBDC, experiment, Project Human, means that the potential of central banks to have nodes clearly exist. You know how many doubters I saw on crypto Twitter saying, nope. No way. All we need is oracles all the way, Chainlink all the way. This is not me fudding Chainlink, you guys. I own Chainlink. I don't like tribalism. I think it's stupid. But you got to keep in mind, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Okay? So Thompson, that we're outlining here, commented that Parser does not, quote, centralized risk in any way. Technology risk, data risk, or financial now, let's get into this part about intra-bank payment networks because we've been talking about it for probably longer than we should. Comparing Parser strategy with one of the other blo uh, big blockchain payment initiatives, Finale, backed by 17 major financial institutions, of course, is very, very useful. For one, Finale's case, while it hasn't yet launched, has already been des uh, designated as a systemic uh, payment system by the uk treasury and its launch has just been delayed by nine months at least partly coming from its payment regulator the bank of england again the quant connection bank of england boom there you go compared to parsers commercial money payments finale payments are all in central bank money this is why i keep saying and uh, you know shout to tokenizer as well he always says you know quant the tokenization of cbdc's i mean come on are we not paying attention to this? This significantly reduces counterparty risk, although it doesn't 100% eliminate it. Now, back to this whole topic of CBDCs. Circling back to it, Thompson sees Parsher as both supporting commercial bank money and central bank money, right? Remember how we talked about M1 and M0? Remember how we talked about M10? And remember how we talked about... Because there was so much criticism. Oh, quant can't scale. Oh, it's garbage. It's just the ERC-20 token. And then we confirmed the whole thing of M10. And M10 confirmed what? M10 confirmed 1 million TPS. My God. Anyway, getting more into this. The, the implication is that commercial money is simply part your starting point. We can do that. Uh, for instance, uh, with payments either on M0 or M1 currency, it doesn't matter to us. Does it matter? Why doesn't it matter? Because you have interoperability. That's why it doesn't matter. And, and you know, what about the problem of scalability? Well, we can scale 1 million TPS through M10. And if you haven't seen that video, you can always go back and watch it. I think it's on the thumbnail. It says trillions, I believe, if that's the one you're wondering about. Parsher is already engaged with multiple central banks, it is involved, of course, in Project Dunbar. Remember, we shared Crypto Lulu yesterday, Lewis Jackson. He covered uh, Project Dunbar numerous times. The multi CBDC project with the central banks of Singapore, Malaysia, and Australia, South Africa, and even the Bank of International Settlements Innovation Hub. And of course, they're guessing that Thompson's London trip partly relates to another BIS Innovation Hub initiative, but it's Project Meridian. And I've been getting more and more into Project Meridian. Right? That's another thing we've been talking about a lot lately, but basically that aims to synchronize real-time growth settlements, infrastructures with what? Digital asset ledgers and payment systems in foreign currencies. Do you not see how it all comes together? Even if you're not a quant holder, do you not see how all this comes together? And that meeting late next month, like what the heck is going to happen? In my opinion, that meeting is that step forward for this to finally all come together because they have the framework and now they just want to simply like cross the t's and dot the i's i could be wrong 
and crazy things could be delayed. I just pay attention to some of the material, just like you guys do. Now, back to SWIFT for a second. Make no mistake, payments are being disrupted. SWIFT also wants to participate in this new CBDC world and launch a trial to interlink domestic CBDCs for cross-board payments while it's understandable to want to transform rather to disrupt its CBDC approach continue to its current role of sending messages rather than money as we observed when it was announced. Now, I want to state this, all right? And this is not FUD towards Chainlink. Like, I would never FUD your guys' investment, nor my own. I have Chainlink as well. But I think this outline, in my opinion, um, maybe not 100% proof, but it, it basically outlines that it's not just one. Remember how many times we said it's not necessarily just XRP being the one to do the job, right? It's, it's numerous other, you know, DLTs and so on. But this outline for Parsher, I think, shows that, you know, with Swift, you can have your chain link partnership. But how about this? JP Morgan, you can have swift replace jp morgan will replace swift by using parser or we at least not following that and then the whole thing of parser rln city city with who quant network and that is confirmed look it up for yourself go right to the quant networks website if you have any doubts all right we're going to get more into this because i mean this is a lot to get into so do you have anything, Max, in regards to yesterday and the whole thing about what you know Cypress Demanticore was talking about? Yeah, I do. How would you like me to elaborate even more further on it? So look at this for a second, and I'll come out of the frame on this one because this is really, really a big deal in my opinion. You will see this guy here, and he is – let me come out of the frame for you to see it a little bit better. This guy is Shamur Kalik. He's a global head of services from City. Yeah, city. Look what's mentioned here. The future of cross-border payments. Who will be moving $250 Because I know some of you guys are like, there's just no way this is going to happen. In the next five freaking years. Unbelievable, right? The world of cross-border payments is an inflection point. As the ecosystem is shaken up by new competition and, and, and technologies, there will be inevitably big winners and losers. The fierce level of competition, cross-border payments is unsurprising given the rewards on the offer. There's a race of who's going to emerge from it, right? You don't think these guys are competing with each other? I think they are. Talks about the evolving landscape that is driven by changing behaviors and heightened expectations with consumers seeking a streamlined, transparent, 24-7 real-time experience. These expectations have crossed over to corporate and institutional clients. New business models, such as direct, to, uh, du excuse me, such as direct to consumer offerings, marketplaces, shared economy models, uh, spurs this whole chain of payments in the world. But look at this highlight: payments are moving away from traditional instruction methods, which are tied to a batch and files, and moving towards what? Application programming interface API connectivity. What is one of the key highlights of the overledger? Interoperability for literally hundreds, maybe even thousands of application programming interfaces, AKA APIs. Getting more into this for a second. I wanna show you some examples. I will stay out of the frame because I want you to see this. So maybe you're not the type of person to follow the whole thing of RLN, but you need to follow it, whether you hold q &T or not to get a bigger idea of the bigger picture of things. So regulated liability network, UK discovery phase, straight from what? Cited from the UK finance. You can look this up for yourself just in case you're a nerd. I mean, a, you know, nerd in a good way. Orchestration and programmability layer, RLN. Do you not see how this is all broken down? real -tell central bank ledger goes to where the integration gateway. Remember how we always talk about quant in those gateways? How about regional RTGS schemes? How about other banks? Notice how they all connect to the integration gateway. We just talked about APIs, did we not? E-money issuers, regulated stable coins as well. Look at how many different banks are used through RLN. How about some of the end users? Well, you have shared ledger for central bank and commercial users. Right dead center in the middle is RLN. Do you not understand how big RLN is? 
All right, let's go down to the bottom part because me and I'm talking your ear off about this. Max, can you give me some freaking examples about quant? I want to see quant. When moon? Analysis was carried out on whether decentralized or centralized infrastructures are more articulately viable. Let me double check my settings here because I don't want the wrong screen up. Okay, I got the right one up. So, yes, yeah, so viable. The analysis revealed that decentralized technology has significant advantages that RLN can benefit from, particularly on the tokenization theory. Don't you love how I talk about tokenization all day yesterday and a few other days before that? But the point is, RLN could benefit from this, particularly on tokenization theory, integrity, transparency, and privacy. The discovery phase technology worked also focused on a comparative analysis of the technical platforms that could best fit RLN um, architecturally. Now, are you ready for the whole quant thing? I know some of you guys see on your screen. After initial research, the analysis was validated by an information gathering exercise with key technology platforms. These, of course, included Corda R3. Who is going to sit with Gilbert Verdi next month, you guys? Adhara, Millicent, Quant, Polygon. Why am I seeing content creators FUD a Polygon for crying out loud? It's part of the quantum financial system. Canton, Digital Assets, Settle, and Knox. These are also a detailed analysis on Quorum, Parity, Hyperledger, Besu. You know how, many how much criticism I gotten about tying in Jasmine with the whole thing of Hyperledger Besu? I know I'm back in the frame. I'm going to get more into this. I mean, I'm telling you flat out, boom. Boy, the match is sticking to stew. Quant all the way. My God. Getting more into this. Let's give you another example real quick. Another visual. Let's come and put it back on the screen. This one might be a little bit hard to see because it's a screenshot or from a cell phone, I believe. Take a look at this for a second. Prototypes developed by who? Parsher on what? Quorum. Are you still not understanding the JP Morgan connection or even the quant JP Morgan connection? What does it say on 1.3.11? Technical architecture. Parsher is based on Ethereum-based distributed ledger, Quorum, that is built with considerations such as ease of integration, data privacy. It is a fork of Go Ethereum client, which is Geth. The official Go language, or Go lang, excuse me, implementation of the Ethereum protocol designed as a private network with a permission group of known participants. Who are some of the known participants? Within the platform, the minimum necessary rule is core to transaction processing, which means information is retrieved on a need-to-know basis. A network consists of multiple nodes through which users connect to the platform. Each node, and I love how Quant Papa highlighted this freaking greatest Quant researcher out there, in my opinion. Each node comprises several components, including an what? API gateway. Hmm. I wonder what that could be. DAP, to Sarah and the Quorum platform. Look at figure 50. I wish I could blow it up more, but that's the biggest it will go. Look at the bank system, payment system, core banking, API gateway. Going to what? The port, the, the partial node through in, in that particular API gateway. Through DAPs. Hmm. Interesting. What about the part about DAPs, Max? Yeah, we'll get to that. A DAP acts as a middle layer, as we know, between conventional systems to the DLT, serving as a translator to convert the user's API into the required smart contract format. Huh. I don't know, Max. I don't think I'm still with you. Do you have anything else? Can you give me one more example? Yeah, I definitely can. This is a 10-minute interview, and if anything, this will definitely give you a broader sense about this whole shebang. So 11 months ago, Finastra at Cybos, growing interest in CBDCs and the emergence of what? RLN, a.k.a. Regulated Liability Networks. Are we not paying attention to this? Let's play this. It's 10 minutes. We're going to watch the whole thing. Please smash that like if you appreciate the content. Here we go. Hello and welcome to Finextra TV. I'm Hannah Wallace and we're here at Cybos 2022 in Amsterdam. Joining me now in the studio is Kelly Matheson from Digital Asset and Majen Delatine from Settle. And we're talking about regulated liability networks in relation to CBDCs. 
Uh, ladies, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Really good to have you on and a fascinating topic at the heart Indeed. of a lot of discussions uh, during CyBOS. And uh, I want to begin by sort of you bringing us up to date and telling us why we're seeing this increased interest, uh, especially amongst the financial institutions and what's driving that trend that's stopped that. You know, I think, uh, you know, we're at CyBOS, so there tends to be a lot of conversation around the securities market. But the securities market is just one half of the story for transactions around the world. Having an ability to focus on digital currency and payment rails is really part of the overall industry dialogue. And I think what we're seeing is real practical discussions on how to get the environments prepared to handle digital currency. So say, a focus on privacy and security in much the same way if you and I were transacting in a euro right now, you should not know how I got that euro and I should not onwardly know what you do with that euro. So privacy and security. I think there's a real focus on um, ensuring that there are elements of the two-tiered banking system, what we know as commercial banks and correspondent banks providing services should continue in digital form. And then opportunities mm. for new features and functionality like programmability. We could talk a bit more about that. But yeah. it's a real practical level of dialogue around how to implement regulated liabilities and digital currencies in, in real world settings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Marjan, does that resonate with what you're saying? Precisely. And I think um, after a few years in the, the world of um, new technology, um, I think that, that there are still a, a lot of hype around all this conversation and, and still many people are confused. I think what um, uh, the questions or the way that um, uh, Kelly is looking at, uh, at it is the right way. Uh, from our perspective, uh, we see the emergence of a token economy and um, different business models around that, right? Mm. And we see that the regulated market is not really equipped enough to tackle mm -hmm. and connect with this new world. Um, so I think CBDC is an important element because this is coming from the oversight and it is in a sovereign representation of sovereign national currencies. Um, and it will help um, the regulated uh, sector to be get to get closer, at least from technology perspective, and also understanding how they have to treat this new technology. So mm -hmm. we see that in a very positive way, actually. That's really interesting. Thanks for bringing us up to date there. And in parallel to uh, the evaluation of CBDCs amongst mm -hmm. the central banks, we're seeing um, the commercial banks as well as the payment providers uh, suggesting a regulated liability network. So I'm interested to hear a bit more about that. And uh, What's that resolving, do you think? Tomorrow? Yeah, I mean, certainly it's one of the more exciting initiatives in the, the marketplace today. And I'm saying that not just simply because we have the pleasure of being involved in it. The, the way I think about it is, in time, there will be digital fiat currencies. There will be CBDC. But as you would expect with anything that's going to involve a central bank, there's going to be probably years of work to make sure that it's sound and secure for not only the government, but the citizens, and that it is not only a part of liquidity, but a part of monetary policy. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. But on the path to getting to that point, there is some real work that can be done to be able to um, uh, ensure that the digital payment rails are set up in a way that can support volume, scale, transaction that you would expect ultimately from these currencies. And I think what's been really brilliant about the approach for the regulated liability network is to say, okay, but we do have a structure in place, that two-tiered banking system that mm. I was talking about, where uh, commercial banks, correspondent banks, many of the attendees here, payment providers, have the infrastructure in place to be able to support the obligation to give you currency on demand. Mm. Well, now we're talking about transforming those payment rails to be digital currency right. on demand. And as a body of work across different institutions, both within the own the banking systems and across the different entities, that is real work that is establishing um, scale, is establishing the ability to have interoperability between those platforms, right? Not one size is going to fit all, right? Um, and to have some of those features and functionality, like the ability to program money for a specific purpose. All of this is really setting the core foundation, not just simply from a technology perspective, but from a ways of working, of a workflow perspective within banks, 
within payment providers and between them. And I think that that in and of itself is an enormous accomplishment. Certainly the work we're doing with, with Settle is really propelling that forward, but it is also setting the stage for CBDC. Yeah, so tell me a bit more about the partnership then. Mijan, would you like to jump in there? Well, of course, yeah, I mean, we are very lucky. And I think um, we see that in the regulated market, there are lots of competition and cooperation. Um, and we, we will see the same trend in the, um, I would say, the digital world. Mm. Uh, and we have been very, uh, I would say, lucky uh, to, to get uh, in contact with uh, our friends from digital assets uh, in order to make sure that um, this is not, again, another new technology that it's in a few years time, everybody is uh, forgetting it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the regulated liability network is very interesting because uh, we came across this uh, of this uh, white paper uh, that it is uh, the, the vision is coming from Tony McLaughlin at City, um, right? at City yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, uh, and he said this uh, from my really from my experience in the past. Um, I, I really saw a real problem to solve, and this is going back to the big difference that it exists between the DLT and tokenized world and the world that we are today in a regulated uh, market. Um, so, the big differentiator from our perspective is the fact that the value is on the network in the DLC. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In any infrastructure, existing infrastructure, you but don't yet, have the value. It still has the, all of the, um, the uh, uh, security or certainty around being regulated that you would expect. And I think that's the difference about what you're saying. It's, 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 a, it's a different way forward of balancing safety and security with innovation. Right? Precisely. Yeah. Um, and, and I think how we can transpose um, this model, that it is a very efficient model, even if it is not heavily used today and it is a bit on the crypto side, but how we can bring that into the regulated market. And mm -hmm. I think this vision, the regulated liability network, is a way for the, this segment to embrace the value while skipping all these requirements from the compliance, uh, from the security, from scalability. So, so we build the very first prototype and then we start another adventure with, uh, with our friends in digital assets because one thing that it is very important in this new board is the programmability, mm -hmm. how you can mm -hmm. create a programmable money mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, now that the value could be on the, uh, uh, on the chain as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a very interesting uh, paradigm. Yeah, I and it's, that's... Uh, it's a initiative that banks need to really think carefully about moving forward, isn't it? So exactly. I'm interested to hear then uh, the impact this is having on cross-border payments as well. So, can Yeah, you that? know, I think it's quite an insightful for question and, and it, it marries up to something that Marjan was saying in terms of networks. I think when you think about the traditional banking system, we are all, or if you're a bank, you're connected to the Federal Reserve or the, the central bank of your company. It's very much sort of a hub and spoke model, meaning we're connected directly to the, the central bank to handle an obligation or a liability on our behalf. And yes, we will work with other banks, but that's messaging. What, what we're talking about here, and Marjan used the word, is, is network. It's about, it's about uh, creating more of an interconnected economic network, not only where we're adding new functionality in the form of being able to support digital currency, still providing the traditional type of banking services you or I would expect as citizens, but allowing for there to be a mutualization of workflow, the distributed ledger that the Marjan is referring to, a mutualization of workflow, and the ability for an economic web to be created, an interconnected economic network. And that, that's different from a hub and spoke model. It's now sort of elevating it to a level of, of interoperability and exchange that we don't see in, in traditional paper-based currencies and is really bringing the digital security world and the digital currency world together. It's really interesting to get your outlook there. And Marjan, is there anything you'd like uh, to add there? No, I think it's uh, precisely uh, um, uh, creating the, the value of the RLN, as we call it, sorry, the Regulated li Liability Network, is solving for settlements. Mm -hmm. And precisely connecting at in any end leg of any financial transaction is payments. You started from securities. And this tokenization is helping actually to connect the two legs. Mm. And this is obviously going to be a big shift. Yeah, yeah. Watch this space, it's safe Absolutely. to say. Uh, well, ladies, thank you so much. I'll leave it there. But thank you for sharing your insights. I'll let you get back to the event. But, uh, thank you so much. Pleasure. It was a pleasure. Thank you. All right. So you may be wondering just who in the world is that lady and how do we, excuse me, like who in the world is that lady and how do we tie in just that much more in regards to that? And that's a great question. 
So I'm going to show you exactly who that lady is and why I think obviously it's a big deal, part of this outline and so on. So almost wrapping this segment up, you're going to see um, this right here. Here we go. Let's share this. Who's that lady? Well, there she is. She is Marjan uh, Delatine, or Delatine, if I pronounce it right. I know the lady in the interview pronounced it right, so I apologize. She's the head of payments over at SETL. Who are they? Well, we'll get into that in a bit, but this quote from her, it is important, excuse me, it is important, ugh, talk too much today. It is important that regulated institutions, sorry, are able to adopt the best blockchain and distributed ledger technology in a way that is open to the whole community. <clears throat> right. And brings real benefits, of course, to clients. I am sure the results of this exercise will be illuminating. Getting into who in the world SETL is and so on. Well, they have a site and it talks about some of this stuff. And basically speaking, we talked a lot about RLN, but look what it says RLN powered by SETL. So, hmm, do you not understand that connection? The regulated liability network arrived, right, or has arrived. SETL's interoperable RLN ledger framework, framework, remember I was saying that earlier, it's now available for you to try out. Huh. Ledger Swarm. Hmm. What in the world is that all about? And again, you guys are more welcome to nerd it out if you choose to do so. This is a screenshot from Crypto Twitter, right? X. SETL supports members of the United States banking community in proof of concept for a regulated digital asset settlement platform. Huh. Wonder what that could be. Getting more into this. Let's share this part. You may be wondering just who is this lady and why pay attention to her? Well, this lady that you saw in the interview, literally that recorded video from not too long ago. She is a person that was hired, right, a while back, back in 2021, February 25th to be exact, 2021. SETL, it made this press release then. They hired Ripple Global Head of Banking to lead payments in business. Huh. So she even has done work with Ripple. Interesting. So, I mean, I think that's worth pointing out, right? Yeah, I think so. Any more into this? Look at this for a second. Talk about the overledger for a second. So fighting climate change. Fighting climate change overledger can be used to implement carbon credit use cases. Uh, they have this thing in regards to COVID recovery. But look what it says here. Tackling economic inequality. Overledger can be used to support use cases related to CBDC and increase access to financial services, whether or excuse me, wherever that's an issue, especially in vulnerable populations. Hence why they got the whole thing with lack chain, right? All right. Just to pound it home just a little bit more before we kick it into the next part of what we have. I know this is a real deep dive tonight. Parser, blockchain-based what? Clearing and settlement infrastructure. Allowing participants and entities to transact 24-7 directly and securely with each other on a single shared ledger. Gave you that breakdown earlier. But, hey, Max, can you give me a JP Morgan example? Yeah, go ahead and take a look at the example. Uh, draw your attention to the right side. Shared ledger for 24-7 availability. DBS SG, right? Talked about DBS earlier. Deutsche Bank. SGB Settlement Bank. <clears throat> for instance, how about JP Morgan? Of New York, USD settlement. I mean, by the way, do we forget that you know there was J.P. Morgan Chase? And how Chase literally used to be called Chase Manhattan Bank. I mean, come on, guys, it's right there for you. Payer ordering bank, beneficiary bank, payee. Well, about on the bottom part, how we have interoperability and connectivity. So you even have some of the other things that we've been talking about in regards to ISO 222. Now we understand um, when it comes to quant they are iso tc3 307 but we have been talking about for instance um chips and we also been talking about chaps and those are of course clearing houses for both the united states and what the uk so you have real-time growth settlements you have the target two system you have fedwire um 
you have for this other one called sips then you also have um rtp with paynet and you also have faster payments and pp what about cbdc's various networks talks about parser being a jp uh, morgan joint venture with dbs and also standard charter next generation market infrastructure provides 24 7 multi-currency real-time growth settlement capabilities leveraging what the existing tier liability structure programmable payments think about this for a second enables next generation programmable value transfer through a common and open platform for participating banks and their customers in real time global interoperability we're always talking about interoperability designed to provide global connectivity across domestic real-time payments rtgs and even central bank digital currencies huh is it future ready? Yeah, it is. Ready for central banks to issue CBDCs to participating financial institutions. That's what FI stands for on the platform. All right. This part's good. This was cited originally from 2017. I want you to think about this for a second. From the Federal Reserve Bank site at the time, there's a screenshot. It says in pursuit of a better payment system, there's a secure payments task force. Huh. Who was on the list? Gilbert Verdian. Who was he part of at the time? Vocalink. Who was what? A subsidiary of what? MasterCard. That's why last night we did the whole thing on MasterCard. All right. How about this real quick? Let's talk about Fintium before we wrap it up. Fintium needed for settlement leg. If the Fintium platform is fully distributed ledger technology base, it makes sense if the underlying settlement, right, in cash is also DLT based. Uncoordinated near leg settlement, you have bank A, bank B. Look what's mentioned on the bottom with ECB. The Euro account and also Euro Nostros. You know what we're talking about with Ripple's XRP, on demand liquidity, you know, Nostro Vostro, how those banks are required to you know hold so much liquidity and so on and how odl is that solution now known as what what do we call it now ripple payments something like that so i still call it odl but the point is look how you have this connected over to a dlt based settlement huh all right almost ready to wrap this up here's another example straight from the quant network just in case you're still a doubter, here is Finaxtra's on overledger authorized. That new thing from Quant. She just love how we tie all this together. So I am going to go ahead and like that and retweet it. But yes, Finaxtra with overledgers authorized, right? That new thing that's part of their brand. It's a new solution for central bank grade key management and transaction signing on any blockchain any blockchain getting into it are you ready for the boil it mash it sticking in stew i think you are what does it say straight from finoxtra max you're so speculative give me a break quant develops central bank grade key management solution for blockchain transactions cited straight from where finoxtra can you give me something a little bit more recent, Max? You better believe I can. October 10th, 2023. And who is the credited source? Plain as day on the site. You go look it up for yourself. Why don't you drop it in the comments for you? How about this? I'll drop it right directly into the comments for you. Here we go. Boom. From Finoxtra. What does it say? Source, Quant. Blockchain for finance pioneer Quant has launched a groundbreaking solution to make blockchain based transactions more secure for banks and other institutions. I think I, I don't need to get more into this. I mean, they're going to talk about, you know, authorized they're talk about project Rosalind. They're going to talk about a lot of stuff and maybe we get more into that tomorrow. But I think I talked your ear off about this. The bottom line is this. This last statement, and it's a quote, sorry, I said talk about you're off, but I want to release this statement. Gilbert Verde has this quote right on Phenoxtra, okay? Blockchain technology has the potential to revolutionize banking, but we cannot unlock its true potential without robust and future-proof solutions of cryptographic key management and transaction authorization. 
This is why in that thumbnail that you saw, was it maybe this morning or yesterday? I put quant is the key. Think about it. I always give you guys a little subliminal messages. This is where Overledger authorized comes in. It brings central bank grade key management and enterprise transaction signing capabilities to the blockchain ecosystem. By integrating existing enterprise key management systems to seamlessly connect and interoperate with multiple blockchains while maintaining high-grade security compliance, we have secured and simplified the adoption of digital assets for banks, institutions, and enterprise developers. So let's go ahead and give this another little brief little one sentence. So earlier he said that, you know, I agreed with uh, Tokenizer in regards to quant and the whole concept of you know, tokenization of CBDCs. One sentence for quant, other than just interoperability, right? Tokenization of CBDCs, right? But what about this statement? I know I'm not on screen anymore. Back to Gilbert Verdian. Overledger, central bank grade key management and enterprise transaction signing capabilities to the blockchain ecosystem. It's creating a CBDC ecosystem. My God, I mean, we could get excited all day long. I, mean, I get excited about, you know, Stellar with Sorbonne, of course, you know, I want to be well diversified. But when I talk about big money, the big, big money, yeah, a CBDC ecosystem and overledger gets the job done for that. Like, how much is that going to be worth? All right. So that is going to close out our coverage tonight in regards to Quant QNT. So glad to be able to provide it to you guys. Thank you so much to the one and only Quant Papa. Give him a follow if you're using Crypto X, the X platform, formerly known as Twitter. He can be followed over at Quant underscore Papa. By all means, give me a follow over at DPG Maximus as well. I really do appreciate it.